Did you know that one of the world's oldest known legal documents hails from India? It's called the Manusmriti. The Manusmriti, also known as the Laws of Manu, is a fascinating text steeped in antiquity. This ancient Indian legal and ethical document primarily delves into a myriad of social, moral, and legal issues. It's a tribute to the legendary sage Manu, a figure of great reverence in Hindu mythology, and is regarded as one of the earliest and most influential works on Hindu law. The text covers a broad spectrum of life, from personal conduct to societal norms, from family matters to the duties of rulers. It's a reflection of the times it was written in, providing us with a window into the societal structure and norms of that era. The Manusmriti outlines a hierarchical social order known as the Varna system, a precursor to the caste system we know today. It prescribes duties and responsibilities for individuals based on their Varna or class and the societal rules they should abide by. The concept of Dharma or righteous duty is a key theme in the Manusmriti. It underscores the importance of fulfilling one's responsibilities and duties in life, in accordance with their varna and stage of life. It also briefly touches upon the duties of rulers, emphasizing the significance of just and fair governance. The Manusmriti also serves as a legal guidebook, outlining punishments for various offenses. However, it's crucial to understand that the Manusmriti is more prescriptive than descriptive and its legal prescriptions are not directly applicable in modern legal systems. Although the Manusmriti has faced its share of criticism for its conservative social norms, particularly around issues such as gender and caste discrimination, it continues to be a subject of intense debate. Many argue for a more inclusive and progressive interpretation of Hindu scriptures, including the Manusmriti. While it's an ancient text, the Manusmriti's echoes can still be heard today, albeit faintly, in the corridors of modern Indian politics. Despite its indirect influence, the Manusmriti remains a significant part of India's cultural heritage and a testament to its rich historical past. At the heart of the Manusmriti lies the concept of social order, primarily represented by the Varna system. This system, as laid out in the ancient text, is a hierarchical structure dividing society into four main categories, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. Each Varna or class had its own set of duties and responsibilities, creating a complex social fabric. Brahmins, considered the highest Varna, were priests and scholars, custodians of religious and intellectual matters. Next were the Kshatriyas, the warrior class, whose duties were to protect society and uphold justice. Vaishyas, the third Varna, were traders and farmers, maintaining the economic stability of the society. Lastly, the Shudras were service providers, performing tasks that supported the other three classes. Over time, this Varna system evolved into the caste system, which became more rigid and hereditary. While the Manusmriti's Varna system was originally based on qualities and duties, the caste system that emerged was based on birth, an aspect that has been a source of social tension and inequality in India. The Manusmriti's social order also extended to gender roles, prescribing specific duties for men and women. Women were largely relegated to the domestic sphere, emphasizing their roles as wives and mothers. This gender bias has been a significant point of contention in modern interpretations and discussions of the Manusmriti. However, it's crucial to remember that the Manusmriti is not a universally accepted or followed text. It represents one perspective within the diverse tapestry of Hindu philosophy and thought. And while its social order has undoubtedly influenced traditional Indian society, it is not a definitive guide to Hinduism or Indian culture. The Manusmriti social order is a mirror to a time in history, reflecting societal norms and values of an era long past. It offers us a chance to understand the roots of certain societal structures and attitudes, while also highlighting the need for their evolution in line with contemporary values. The Manusmriti's social order set the stage for societal norms that, for better or worse, still impact India today.
If the Manus Muriti were a compass, Dharma would be its north star. Dharma, a concept central to Indian philosophy, is often translated as duty, morality, or righteousness. However, its essence is far more nuanced, encompassing the moral and ethical duties that one must perform to live a righteous life. In the Manus Muriti, Dharma is presented as the guiding principle for individuals and society. It outlines a framework of duties and responsibilities for each varna or social class with the aim of ensuring social harmony. The text emphasizes that adherence to one's dharma, regardless of one's social standing, is the key to leading a virtuous life. But the Manus Moriti doesn't just stop at individual duties, it extends the concept of dharma to governance, sketching a blueprint for the moral and ethical functions of a ruler. The text suggests that a king, or any ruler, should be the embodiment of dharma. They are entrusted with the task of ensuring justice, maintaining order, and protecting their subjects. The king's dharma, in essence, is to serve as the guardian of societal harmony and well-being. It's important to understand that the Manusmriti's depiction of dharma isn't just about adherence to rules. It's about upholding a moral compass that guides actions and decisions. The text encourages rulers to be fair, compassionate, and just, emphasizing that their power should be exercised for the welfare of their subjects, not for personal gain. The influence of the Manusmriti's concept of Dharma on ancient Indian governance is undeniable. But it's fascinating to see how this ancient text's ideas continue to spark discussions on governance and morality in the modern era. While the direct application of these principles in today's political landscape may be limited, they serve as a reminder of the importance of moral and ethical governance. And so, the Manusmriti's concept of Dharma continues to inspire discussions on governance and morality, even in the 21st century. As we navigate the complexities of modern governance, perhaps there's value in revisiting these ancient texts not to blindly follow them, but to extract wisdom that can guide us towards a more just and equitable society. The Manus Muriti isn't just a moral guidebook. It's a legal document that outlines punishments for various offenses. Indeed, the Manus Muriti extends beyond spiritual and moral teachings to offer a comprehensive legal code. It addresses a wide range of matters, from property rights and contractual obligations to criminal offenses and their respective penalties. In an era devoid of formalized legal systems, the Manus Mriti served as a crucial instrument of governance, guiding rulers on matters of justice and law enforcement. It provided a framework for social order, delineating the responsibilities of rulers and subjects alike. While the legal codes of the Manus Mriti may appear archaic to us today, they were revolutionary for their time. They introduced concepts such as proportional justice, suggesting that the severity of a punishment should correspond to the seriousness of the offense. This was a significant shift from the eye for an eye retribution common in many ancient societies. However, it's crucial to consider these codes in their historical context. The Manus Mriti was formulated in a vastly different era with different societal norms and values. It doesn't reflect the complexities of modern legal systems, which are influenced by centuries of philosophical, societal, and technological advancements. Notwithstanding, it's intriguing to see how some principles have endured. For instance, the Manus Mriti's emphasis on truthfulness and integrity resonates with contemporary legal principles like the perjury law. But let's clarify one thing, the legal code of the Manus Muriti doesn't govern modern India or any contemporary society. Today's legal systems are informed by constitutional law, human rights norms, and international legal standards. The Manus Muriti, like other ancient texts, is studied for its historical significance rather than its legal applicability. Yet, the Manus Muriti's legal codes continue to spark interest. Scholars delve into them to understand the evolution of jurisprudence while cultural explorers examine them to glean insights into ancient Indian society. Though ancient, 
the legal codes of the Manusmriti offer a fascinating insight into the judicial thinking of the time. As with any influential text, the Manusmriti isn't without its critics. It's a document that has stirred much debate, especially in the contexts of gender and caste discrimination. One of the key areas of criticism is the Manusmriti's Varna system, which later evolved into the caste system. The text outlines duties and responsibilities based on individual's varna or social class. Critics argue that such a system inherently promotes social inequality and discrimination, a point of contention that has sparked heated debates in contemporary India. Furthermore, the Manusmuriti's treatment of women has also been scrutinized. The text is often criticized for prescribing restrictive roles and duties for women which some interpret as reinforcing gender discrimination. Debates have arisen around these interpretations, with some arguing that these prescriptions reflect the societal norms of the time rather than an inherent bias in the text itself. Despite these criticisms, there are also voices advocating for a more nuanced understanding of the Manusmriti. They argue that the text needs to be understood in its historical and cultural context. For them, the Manusmriti is a reflection of the societal norms and values of a bygone era, not a blueprint for modern society. Additionally, some proponents argue that the Manusmriti has been misinterpreted and misused, leading to the propagation of social evils such as caste and gender discrimination. They assert that a more inclusive and progressive interpretation of the Manusmriti, and indeed all Hindu scriptures, is possible and necessary. As we navigate these debates, it's important to remember that the Manusmriti is not a static text. Like all religious and philosophical works, it is subject to interpretation and reinterpretation. It's a living document, shaped and reshaped by the societies that engage with it. In the grand scheme of Indian politics, the Manusmriti may not hold the sway it once did, but it continues to stir debates and discussions, making it a text worth reflecting upon.